just in the renegade, one of the hackles is a grizzly and in the other, it's, they're both sort of a, a furnace color, but they're bas basically the same other than thread. So for the, for the standard renegade, I'm going to use a, a black ADOT. We'll start with that. Uh, let me get a little better light on here. Is this for pike or for trout or what? Big pardon? Is this for pike or trout? Uh, it's one of my go-to grayling flies, but it's also a very good trout or a trout fly. Any fish that feeds on the surface. So I'll start with, uh, I'm going to go slowly here because we had some people who are new to fly time. <laughs> Rob? <laughs> yeah, it's and, me. And so we're, we're going to take some time and I'll go over basic technique as we go. So to attach the thread, I'm going to attach the thread just behind the eye. And I hold the thread at, at a bit of an angle uh, with the tag end below the eye and the thread going over top. And Is I'll that a thread it, or a wire? It's a thread. It's there. Okay. Hey, Newton, for new fly tires, you talked about 20 minutes about the hook, the metal and the hook, right? Well, I'll talk about the hook in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're, we, what we're using for the hook is, is this guy here. It's a, it's a standard TM Co 101 drive. Number fly. 10. Okay. Yeah, and this is not now. Let me see if I got a 10. This, you can dye this dye down to size 18 if you if you want to try it. <laughs> I'm doing 10 because it's a little easier to see on the video here. Okay. Uh, not, not that smaller isn't good. Um, okay. So, and it the TM the 101 is a little longer shank than the average dry fly. Uh, it's more like one and a half x long shank. It's not like a one x long shank for a short dry fly hook. This one also has what's called a ring eye. So you can see the eye is not turned up or down. It's parallel to the bank of the hook. Um, so I'm gonna start right behind the eye and I will make a couple of wraps right behind the eye, right up tight to the eye because there's a little gap when the eye is formed in the factory. There's a little gap oh. when the end comes around and rejoins the shank. A, a quick question. Uh, yep. How do I put the thread onto the tool you got? I, I bought a bunch of tools. Ah, yeah. okay. Well, let, let me just finish this a little bit and I'll tell okay, you. Okay, go ahead. So, um, so once you've got that wrap, I, then I hold the tag end up and I wrap over top of the tag. Now the way you can, one of the, one of the first things we talk about is when you're working with a bobbin, which is the thing you put your thread on. Um, you want to keep the distance between the fly and the tip of the bobbin short. That allows you to place where the thread wraps go on the hook. If the tip of the bobbin is towards the rear of the hook uh, compared to where it touches the, the wire, the thread will go back to the back. If it's to the front, that angle will cause the thread to walk forward. If it's at right angles, it'll wrap right over top of each other. So for thread control, what you want to do is try and keep it those angles fa fairly short or fairly fairly narrow. Um, once you get four or five wraps over top of itself by holding that thread up and wrapping towards the back, you can then come on top. And I always here's an admonition: whenever you're clipping off thread or material always do it on top of the hook with your bobbin underneath. That way you don't run the risk of going snip and having your bobbin hit the floor and everything unravel. I then just slide my scissors down till it hits the top of the hook and snip. And with, with sharp scissors, you just have to touch the thread and it'll come apart. Um, now, bobbins. Uh, these, these ones here are are not your standard bobbin. This is a, called a right bobbin, R-I-T-E. They're, like kind of they're kind of on the expansive side. But the thing I like about them, you see this little thing on the, it looks like a four prong clover. 
um, that is a tension adjustment. The thing I like about these is you can adjust the tension on these bobbins to suit your thread very precisely. Um, you just click this little knob back and forth. There's another manufacturer that makes one similar to this. It helps you control the tension. For a standard bobbin, which I don't have with me, it's just got two little bobs on the end and it, it looks like a wishbone. And the thread goes in between those two and goes up the tube. If you're looking at buying any of those, you want ones that have a, an agate or a, a plastic insert. You don't want the bare tube ones because the bare tube ones uh, have a tendency over time to wear and they'll cut your thread. So when you get those ones that have the little wishbone thing, you can control how the tension is on the bobbin by either spreading them apart or squeezing them together before you put the bobbin in the, 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 the thread in between. <clears throat> we'll come back to that later. So now when I've got this thread on, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call it what's called dressing the hook. And that means I'm going to wrap the thread all the way down the hook shank. And I'm going to make it with what we call touching turns, where each turn of thread touches the one before it. This is where you practice doing this, and you will get very good at controlling where the thread is going on the hook. Little terminology while we're at it, of course. With a standard hook, this is the eye here. This part is the hook that goes straight back from the eye is called the shank. Where it starts to go around the corner, that's the bend. There's the point, obvious. Underneath where the barb used to be is where I'm going to stop wrapping the thread towards the back. One of the things you'll notice as I was sitting here, you probably can't see. But my thread at the bottom there is tending, when I let it hang, it tends to spin. And if you're looking down on top of it, it tends to spin counterclockwise. When it does that because there's a twist in the thread. And if you let it spin counterclockwise, some of the threads will unwind their twist and they'll go flat. Uh, some of them will not. One of the problems with, with letting that twist go is that when you try to make a little loop on top here uh, to, to, to capture material, you see that loop when it's untwisted tends to fall towards the front of the hook. Whereas if you subsequently, when it's sitting down here like that, if you swim that, spin that sucker when you're looking down on top clockwise, let it hang and spin it clockwise. Then when you make that soft loop, the loop is going to fall the opposite way. So what I'm going to attach at the back for this one is a grizzly hackle. This is a grizzly hackle. And I'm going to size it when I select it off the neck. I'm going to size it so that when I bend it around the hook shank, the tip of the hackle will extend a little bit down past the point. I want it to be uh, basically the gap between the shack and the point. I want it to be about one and a half that distance, maybe a little less for this fly. And and the the the, the material that's going to come off of for this fly, it's really nice to get what's called a saddle. This is a saddle, and saddles are quite expensive. They can be quite expensive. Um, but a good saddle is worth the money. You can see this, this comes off the back of a rooster. And you can see how long these fibers are. And there's, there's different size of ones depending on where you put it, how close they take it to the front or the back. And the nice thing about these long saddles is you can tie multiple flies out of them. And the length and stiffness of the barbules out from the shaft of the handle is consistent and they're relatively stiff. So this happens to be the end of one of those. And I'm gonna lay this down so that the, what I prepared this hackle by stripping a few 
uh, fibers off of the, the stem to expose the stem. And, and about a, uh, a little more than an eighth, less, a little less than a quarter, about three sixteenths of an inch. And I'm gonna make a loose wrap over the top. And you see, I've allowed my, my thread to go counterclockwise so that that makes that loop fall towards the back. And so I make a loop, loose loop, loop over top and that captures the stem. Then I'm gonna bring my thread forward about, normally I would just stop my thread there to tie, but what I wanna do is I want to, I'm gonna wrap this hackle around the stem. So I wanna get my thread out of the way that will, so that it'll let me do that. Now I'm gonna make two or three widely open wraps with the, the angle quite steep here. One, two, three, four. And let my thread hang up near the eye of the hook. That gets my thread out of the way so that when I take the stem of the hackle and I'm gonna use a pair of hackle pliers for this. Hackle pliers are these guys. This is a rotary style. And I'm gonna use that because it will stop the hackle from twisting as I wrap it. I'm gonna catch it in the, in the hackle plier. Then I'm gonna go around the shank of the hook, trying to avoid the bobbin. And I've chosen to put this hackle on so that the intensely colored side, these hackles have an intensely colored side and a dull side. And I want the dull side down and the intense side up. That pulled right out. I need to shrink wrap another piece of stuff on that. Um, and I'm gonna wrap these, these hackle wraps almost right on top of one another, just slightly progressing forward. Um, and as I wrap, I'm gonna give it a little wiggle so that it doesn't trap the barbules of the previous wrap underneath the stem. And that allows me to get a nice bushy hackle at the end. And after five or six wraps, I'm gonna get a nice bushy hackle like that. Then I'm gonna unwrap my thread from the front and bring it back to where it was. So that's four or five unwraps and that brings my thread back to where I had left it before. And I'm gonna hold this up with my right hand, use my left hand and I'm gonna pass the thread in this V here over top of the stem and let it hang below. I'm gonna do that three times. Let the bobbin hang, then I'm gonna swap hands. I'm gonna take that hackle with my left hand now. I'm gonna hold it back and I'm gonna wrap just in front to push up against that stem. And that's what we call locking in the material. Now, if I let it go, it's, it's gonna, the hackle is actually gonna stick up a little bit. Um, but what that does is that bends the stem up when you wrap in front of it. And that means that it's not gonna unwrap when I snip it off close to the, again, let the thread hang below. I'm gonna come down, I'm not gonna come down and snip this, I'm gonna bring the blade of my scissors up against the stem and I'm gonna pull it against the blade and that'll take it off. And the reason I don't snip it is because that will cut some of the fibers that I've already got. Now I'm gonna use my two fingers and my thumb and I'm gonna wet, wet this a little bit and stroke those fibers back so they're kind of out of the way. And then I'm gonna spiral my thread forward little less, little closer spirals than the last one. And I'm gonna leave it probably about three eye diameters back from the eye. And then I'm gonna collect the next material, this peacock curl. And I'm gonna take probably 
three st strands of peacock curl, maybe five, three or four. For four for a size 10 fly is probably a good number. And I want peacock curl that's fairly fuzzy. Sometimes these packages look like they're almost stripped. So I, I'm gonna take this off. Now to tie this in, there's a little trick about tying some materials in. I'm gonna hold this material between my thumb and forefinger and I'm gonna come up with the scissors and I'm gonna snip this material about an eighth of an inch in front of my thumb and four fingers. So there's this little stub sticking out. I'm gonna set that stub down at kind of a 45 degree angle on the near side of the hook with my thumb and forefinger right where the thread's hanging. And then again, I have to untwirl that thread. I'm gonna make a, a wrap over top of that material, one wrap. And then I'm gonna slide my thumb and forefinger back and I'm just gonna pull on that material a little bit to suck the cut ends back till they're almost where the thread is. And then I'm gonna wrap over the cut ends. That allows you to not have to tie it on and snip it. You do the snip ahead of time. Then I'm gonna wrap over top of all of this stuff. I'm gonna hold the peacock curl up at that angle, 45 degree angle. And I'm gonna wrap down over top of those strands of peacock curl right back to where the hackle I tied on stopped. And see now they're poking straight up. Now one of the problems with peacock curl is that it's kind of fragile and a truck truck will get his teeth in there and he'll uh, he'll chop it and then it'll unwind on you. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to take this peacock curl and hold it a bit in front of my thread, hold the thread out to the side, and I'm going to wrap the peacock curl around the thread clockwise. And I'm gonna make sure that those wraps are, are fairly close to the shank of the hook. And I'm gonna make a number of wraps. And the reason for this is now the thread reinforces the peacock curl. Now I'm gonna grab the thread and the peacock curl where they are together, they come together, and I'm going to wrap over the shank of the hook. And I'm gonna start wrapping forward, one wrap in front of the other. And then every once in a while, I'll have to slide my fingers down the thread with the peacock curl. And I may need to make some more wraps around the thread from time to time. I'm gonna make sure that there's a nice fuzzy, even body between all the way around the hook shank. And when I get to this front again, when I'm back to this sort of an eighth inch behind the eye, I'm gonna separate the peacock curl from the thread and hold it up at that 45 degree angle, pass the thread in between one, two, three, and I'll lock the material in by pulling that back and wrap in front of it up against it. One, two, three. And again, see it's nice locked in, it's pointing straight up. Bring my scissors down on top till it hits the hook shank and snip. There's your peacock curl body. And now I'm gonna use the two-tone technique here. So what I have is a, this is called a furnace hackle. And a furnace hackle, I'm gonna find it here. It's a brown hackle that has kind of a dark core when you get down near the stem. And it's a saddle as well. And I have taken a short little piece here. Again, I'm going to prep it so that I have a bit of stem sticking out. Measure the length of the barbules. This one might be a little short, but it's not bad. And then I'm going to tie this one in again so that the intensely colored portion of the feather outside of the feather is facing me. And I'm going to put that 
stem down up against the shank on my side and I'm going to wrap two or three times and I've got a little bit of stem sticking out here so I'm going to fold that back and I'm going to wrap over top of that and the reason for that little piece of stem being folded back is again I'm locking this material in I'm going to wrap over the stem back until I hit where the peacock curl started I'm going to wrap my thread forward out of the way and for those who don't have a rotary hackle plier, here's the standard English style. And I'm gonna grab the tip of the hackle with that. And to wrap this, I'm gonna put my finger into that hoop and I'm gonna wrap around with it. And by putting my finger in there, what happens is the hackle plier doesn't twist and the hackle doesn't twist as you wrap it over the hook shank. It just goes around straight. And I'm gonna get four or five wraps and get that front looking just about as bushy as the back. One more. And once again, I'm going to hold this up at that 45 degree angle at the end pass the thread through and I'm going to wiggle the thread just a little bit as I pass it through to make sure I don't catch any barbules. Three times, oops, three times in behind. And then I'm going to pull it back, swap hands, pull it back three times in front. And again, come down and once again, I'm not going to snip I'm going to pull the edge of the blade right at top of the hook and just pull it out. There we go. Broke. Then just to secure everything, I'm going to make three or four or five wraps in front of all that apple. I'd have to pull it back out of the way. I'm going to make sure there's enough room in front of the eye to do the whip finish by, I can use my fingernails of my thumb and one of my fingers to squeeze in behind the eye and that'll tend to push some of those wraps back a bit. And then I'm going to take my whip finisher. You'll have the, one of these tools. It's called a Mattarelli style whip finisher. I hold it out, hook it on the thread, wrap the thread around the little wiggly part and bring it down onto the, the, the shank so that I get this figure upside down figure four then I'm going to let go of the little bead and let the, hat, the whip finisher spin. And I'm going to go around there three or four times. When I get the fourth or third or fourth, I push the whole tool towards the back. And that causes the loop to fall off that bent part. And then I'm pulling with my left hand and pulling up the point towards the eye of the hook. And I take that point out and I'm done, except I want to do a two just so I don't have to use glue on this guy. So again, I hold this by the bead, hook the thread, wrap it around, wrap it around the bend here. Make it a figure four. One, two, three, push, pull. Once again, I'm going to get my Scissors in here, just with the edge of the scissor, I'm not gonna to need to snip. Just put it up against the thread and pull against the edge and it's done. And if you wanted to glue, you would put a little dab of glue there, but I think with two wraps like that, you don't need to do two. And that is your standard Renegade. It works as, as a what we would call a cluster of midges or a very large midge emerger. And it's, it's quite an effective fly. Now I'm going to do the Henry's Lake version. And the Henry's Lake ver version, again, this one of the things you I always do is I, if the hook has a barb, I will use a pair of pliers that have no, no uh, grooves on them. It's they're flat edge pliers, electronics pliers. And I will bend down the barb of the hook 
This way I'll never get caught with a fly in my box that hasn't been debarked. And it's catch and release fishermen, not catch and release fish. <laughs> I've had more than one person to take a hook out their finger with a barb and it's not fun to do. Okay, I'm gonna tie that in, get that in the hook shank and I'm gonna make sure it's, the jaws are tight enough that uh, if I pull down on with my thumb on the point, it's not gonna move in the vise. So Henry's Lake is in Yellowstone. And the variant that they tied for this one is they use red thread. So you can see I've got a red thread here. I'm going to do the same thing. Wrap behind the eye. This will go a little faster. Three or four wraps. And then I'm going to point, push the tip of the bobbin towards the rear. Hold the thread up at an angle. And I'm going to wrap over top of itself. I get a little bit on there. The bobbin can hang. Won't unwrap. Come on top. Snip off the thread. And then again, keep the distance between the bobbin and the and the tip and the and the thread and the hook short, so that you can control where that thread goes. And I'm going to go all the way down the shank of the hook in close turns, and it makes the shank of the hook slightly red. And when I get all the way down to where the barb used to be. I'm going to stop. And this time I'm going to take a, a, a hackle that I'm going to use is a brown hackle. It's a furnace hackle. And I've prepared it by stripping off the fluffy part at the bottom. I pre-measured it so that it's the proper length. You can actually get a, a device that you can it's, you can't see it on here. I've got a little pin on a little board here that has the sizes of the hooks marked. And by wrapping it around there, I can see which hook size it's for. There's a little tool you can get that lays on your vice shaft that allows you to do that. Again, I'm going to take this hackle and you can see that it's got a intensely colored side and a dull side. And I'm gonna tie it on at the back so the dull side faces me. And when I lay it down at that angle and make the first wrap over top, I want you to notice that there's about a sixteenth of an inch of bare stem between the hook and where the barbs start on the hackle. That means that the first wrap of hackle around the stem is going to be stem. And that'll help keep the hackle from twisting at the very back. And I'm going to, when I get two or three wraps over the stem, I'm going to bend the stem up and I'm going to wrap in front. Again, that locks that stem in, that little bend in the thing locks the stem in so that it's not going to pull out when I start to wrap the hackle. Again, I'm going to snip it off on top. And I'm going to make a wrap here and then I'm going to do one, two, three four and get that thread out of the way. Take my hackle pliers and that first wrap will get it going the right way because it's stem. No, it didn't. <laughs> I didn't get enough stem on there. I have to come back and unwind that hackle pulled right out. Must not use enough thread pressure. Bend over. There you go. Bend over. Use my thumb to bend that little piece of stem over. And I'm going to bind it down. There we go. Now my thread's out of the way. Okay, he's not going anywhere. Once again, acoplier around. So this is the same routine. So 
four or five rats will do the trick. Now, some versions of this fly, they actually wrap the red thread around, slightly around the bend to make a red butt. And I'll show you that in a minute. I've got one of those. And I can unwrap these open wraps to bring my thread back to where the hackle is. Hold it up in that V1, two, three, pull it back. One, two, three, come in here and up against the hackle. And there it goes. Bring my thread forward. Now those don't have to be touching turns, but close. Just a few wraps. Do again about a, uh, two or three eye widths back from the eye. I don't want to crowd the eye on this fly. I need to make some. So I got again three strands. And I'm going to come in here and I'm going to pre trim them about an eighth of an inch shy of where my thumb and forefinger come together. Lay it down on the hook. One loose wrap. One loose wrap. Two, and then I'm going to pull that stuff back so I don't have to trim it. And then I wrap over top of this stuff all the way back to where the previous hackle was tied in. And again, going to go clockwise around. About eight or nine wraps. And I happen to have a rotary vise. If you have a rotary vise, this makes things easy because now I can just turn the vise and I can lay this hackle down very nicely all the way up the shank. One of the advantages of having a rotary vise is it allows you to do this stuff with a little more control. And I'm going to hold that up and wrap through that V again. Swap it back. Come in here on top, down to the shank and gently snip that off. Now I've prepared another hackle already and it also is a furnace hackle. I'm going to put that stem down, take the twist out of the thread. You can't see I have to bend that sucker counterclockwise. One, two, three, four. Lift up the butt. One, two, three, four. That's locked in. That won't come unnutted like the previous one. Again, down on top. Snip. And then, uh, there's my echo pliers. And again, I'm going to make four or five wraps right up tight against that peacock curl. And when I selected these two hackles, I took them off of the same part of the saddle. So they're almost identical in length. There we go. Up to the right. One, again, a little wiggle as I do this so I don't trap any fibers. And then back. And you'll notice I left a little bit more room at the front this time because I want to have a prominent red head. So I'm going to pull this back and I'm going to wrap several wraps of thread over this so that I got a nice little bit about an eye width that's red thread. And then use our whip finisher around, oh, come on. You know, I have more trouble with 
the whip finish than I do by my hand. <laughs> Tag with it. <laughs> the way I do that is I put my fingers across the thread with my palm out. I turn around so the palm is now facing me and lay that thread down so I make the figure four again. And I push over the top with my top finger and pull underneath with the bottom one. And I wrap the standing piece around three times, hold on to the loop, pull the loop down, snug it up, and I'll do that again. Dave, this would also be a good fly for uh, an ant hatch. Yes. So that's him. Now the, the, the nice, the difference between the Henry's Lake version and, and the regular uh, Renegade is that the Henry's Lake version uses red thread, which causes that red here and a, a red butt. I'll show you another one in the middle. And you can actually see the red thread embedded in the peacock curl. So it has kind of a reddish glow to the peacock curl. And I'll get one out here that I put the red butt on. And you can see even more so. I've got a little bit of a butt of red around the end here. And there's the red head and a little bit of red in here. It's a little hard to see in this light, but it's there. And that's it. That's the Henry's Lake Renegade. Hey, uh, Dave, can I make a comment on the geography of Henry's Lake? Sure. Um, a very famous uh, fishing river is the Henry's Fork of the Snake River. Yep. And the lake itself is closer to the Snake River, but the, uh, the river, the Henry's Fork uh, River is upstream of the lake and it starts almost right at uh, Yellowstone Park. Yeah. So the majority of the river is not in the park and there is one fishing lodge on it and uh, it's a very famous fishing river. Yeah. A lot of people have fished it and uh, I know a bit about it because uh, one of my ex-students went and worked for the, uh, the Henry's Fork Foundation which does all kinds of uh, work keeping that river in pristine condition. Anyhow, that's that's the geography. <laughs> <laughs> well, th this one we we I've used this for for grayling on streams. I've used it on the pothole lakes when the midges are hatching in the spring. Uh, it's a very effective fly. Don't uh, like it. So, just as an aside, <laughs> I'll show you. I have a little project I'm working on. I'm going to make myself a tool caddy. Um, you, you can see I've got a whole bunch of tools lined up in a piece of wood. I've been drilling holes to put figure out what size for each tool. And I bought this beautiful piece of Honduras mahogany from uh, 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 Windsor plywood. And so I'm going to be drilling holes in that piece of Windsor plywood to stick all my tools in. so I don't have to leave them lying on the table all the time. Looks good, Dave. That's my project for the next week. <laughs> there you go. So, Florin, you're on. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Dave. OK. So hopefully that, uh, so hopefully that and Dave gave the new tires a few little hints on little tips and tricks that, yeah. that you'll, you need to, to do well. Okay, I, I, I've never tied a fly, but can I make a comment? Sure. Uh, you had this uh, gizmo. I tried to keep up to you, but you had this gizmo. I got the threads here and I got, the, I bought a tool kit, a basic tool kit from Robinson's. Yep. Uh, I saw you 
flipping around with your uh, thread. Uh, where do I put that and how do I put it in? You had a tool there. That's um, a basic question. I know it's a beginner, beginner, beginner thing, but. Uh, so are we, are we talking the one to do the, the, the whip finish at the end? I uh, know at the very beginning too, you had, uh, you flipped um, the thread around with uh, some kind of, a, you had it attached to a tool. I think yeah. that's the hackle flyer. That, no, I don't know what uh, it was. No, but, he uh, had the uh, thread yeah, in a bobbin. I think he's asking a bobbin. I think bobbin. he's asking about the bobbin. One there How does the Lauren? bobbin work? Tell Have me. Have you got I, a standard one, Lauren? Okay, can I? Um, yeah, you, you go ahead. I, I maybe I'm in the wrong. Uh, okay, that's no. no. What you what you have probably looks like this. I got like this. You see it? Wait just a minute. I got this uh, with my toolkit. Where is it? Uh, let me look. Just a minute. You got something that's shaped like a Y, like this. I, yeah, I got that. Yeah, yeah, it's right here. Yeah, yeah. that's a bobbin. I, I got that sucker. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a right bobbin. Here. That that that's your bobbin. He's okay. Right here. I don't think they got gave him a bobbin threader. I think that's he's gonna have well, to suck. What do I do? I, I I I saw you flipping around. I thought, well, shit. I okay. had to flip by my hand. It didn't work. So okay. So what? Okay. So here's here's the thing. What I'm using. Well, is, show them how to put the thread in the bobbin first. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm trying to do. Okay, um, but I got that wire thing too. I got a bunch of tools here. Okay, so you got you got some kind of a tool that has a wire loop attached to it. Let me look. It's right here. I think it's this. Say, eh? where are you? Yep. Yeah. That's the threader. That, okay. So what you do is you take you take the end of the wire loop and you put it through the tube of the bobbin. The tube of the bobbin. That's the uh, the, the metal thing. What's the bobbin? Well, yes, the 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 bobbin is this this thingy. That thingy. Okay. Let me look. I got that thingy right here. Yeah. Yeah. I got one of those. Yep. Okay. Yep. You you put you put your you put your you put your thing your thread or through your the, wire through the head. Where of the, do I put it? Put the wire okay. through. The... Okay. Let, let let me do this differently. Okay. Uh, well, uh, here. I mean, okay. I'm, I'm I'm just I'm a rank beginner, so I can go somewhere else. But I thought you guys were yeah. Help okay, but this is this is gonna take a while. I don't know if this is the right time to do this. Okay, well we can we can get an email and we'll do it later. Uh, that's fine. So you, the you, other guys you put, are bored. So you put you put your you put your you put your wire through the tube of the bobbin. I see that. Yeah, through the bottom. Okay. Yeah, I see that. And it it'll come. The loop is gonna come out through the end. Right. Okay. Okay. And then you put your thread. Your thread okay. goes your thread the, the spool of thread goes between the arms of the bobbin like this. I guess I see. Yeah, yeah I'm looking. Uh, I'll, okay. I'll get the yeah. And then what you do is you pull the thread through this loop. Right. Around. Not around, through the loop. So you take the thread off the spool and you put it, you put it through the loop. Yeah, the tag end of the thread. Yeah, the tag end of the thread. And then you pull, make sure you have enough thread. And then you pull on the other end and the loop is going to pull your thread through the tube. I tell you, the thread is pretty fragile. It doesn't go down the tube. So it, that's it what will go. Just give get get enough thread and and pull it through, and it it it'll it it'll go through. Okay. Okay. You probably you'll probably find YouTube videos showing this in. I'll much, do that. Much I'll nicer that. detail. Okay. And and, and by the way, if you're an absolute rank beginner. 
I am exactly. Um, I, I, I tend to warmly recommend to anybody who starts fly tying. Okay. I like to recommend this book. What's by the book? Charlie Craven. It's called Basic Fly Tying. Basic Fly Tying. Just a minute. Basic Fly Tying by who? Charlie Craven. Charlie, C H R L I E, Craven, C R A V I N. Yep, Charlie Craven. Okay. Yep. And it's okay. got good I'll, pictures I'll, I'll, and it's I'll got order one of those. Yeah, yeah. And it's got step by step instructions on doing okay. stuff. Okay. So, I'll, I'll, um, I'll look at that. Yeah, yeah. That's what I need. Yeah, that I I find that to be uh to be quite to be quite I need helpful. basics. I need basics to start. So uh I don't want to bother you guys because you're advanced. Yeah. Hey, yeah, no, no, I mean, that's, it's, it's, that's why we're here. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. no, we're, we're, we're happy <laughs> to help, but we don't want you to, to try to jump in at the deep end of the pool and then kind of no, no, I wasn't struggling I was with it, to, you know. I was trying to follow, but I I got all my gear. I got the feathers. I thought we were doing a woolly bugger today, so I got the gear and I got everything, but I just couldn't keep up because I couldn't <laughs> flip the, uh, the the cords around the uh, shanks. Anyway, yeah, that's so why at the beginning I, will, I mentioned I that we recorded for that purpose. I will okay. figure it out, and next time I will be on and I'll be organized. Okay, thanks, guys. Okay, so um, I I send you. I'm I'm sorry again. I I, I send the uh, information about the today's fly tying very very late last night as a, as a PDF, and um, <clears throat> I just thought I'd I'd say a few a few words about this uh, stuff I'm, I'm I'm tying today. So the the guy after whom this this fly is named was a chap by the name of. Henry Chamley Pennell, and uh, he was a writer of all kinds of things, including poetry, not just fishing books. But the great thing is that a lot of these fishing books are out of copyright. So you can go to this wonderful place, which you might already know about, called the Internet Archive. It's simply the uh, address is archive.org. And you do a search for Chumley Panel. And bingo, you've got a bunch of books you can look at. Okay. And the one that I'm pulling up here, it's called The Modern Practical Angler from the good old modern times of 1870. And what was interesting to me looking at this book was this first page with a colorful illustration. And if you read in the book, uh, the author says, look, you only need six flies, three for salmon, these are the big colorful ones, and three for trout, yellow, brown, and green. And today I'm going to do the so-called black panel, which, well, doesn't look like one of the three trout flies. It looks like this. So there we go again. Here is the finished fly. Okay. It's a pretty simple fly, uh, all things considered. What's really um, kind of difficult about this fly is to make it come out nice and neat, like you see in in videos or or picture books where people tie these things and you go like wow okay so i'm gonna try to show you how you can get these things to look reasonably reasonably nice part of the trick is to be gentle with materials not to put too much on the hook and try to keep things slim and sparse so I'm going to demonstrate instead of that big hook that I put on, I'm going to demonstrate with a size 14 hook. And I'm planning on going down to tie some 16s because this fly is supposed to be good for um, chironomids. Okay. So I'm using a dot black thread like Dave was, was using earlier. Just start at the head of the hook and do a thread 
base for the entire fly. And again, in order to get things nice and neat here, what is important is to keep this base smooth so that everything else that gets attached on top of it also stays nice and smooth. Okay, so go to about where the bend of the hook starts. And then the tails come from a golden pheasant tippet. And what I like to do with this is normally when, when we use hackle fibers of any kind, we just strip them off the feather. Well, this would be a bad idea with this one because what you want is you want to preserve as much of the alignment of the tips. With regular hackle, not so important because you can hardly see it. Probably not very important with this either, but people look at your flies and if you're the kind of person who cares about that um, and whether you get oohs and ahs when people look in your fly box, uh, you may wanna proceed slightly differently than, than usual. So what I try to do is pull about four fibers of this pheasant between my, my fingers and try to get them aligned before I do anything with, so these are fairly reasonably aligned for the ends. Transfer to my other hand and hold firmly and then just snip the feather off. Okay. So now I've got my pheasant fibers. I'm going to measure between the eye of the hook and the point where I stopped with the thread, so body length. Lay these at about a 40 degree, well, it's actually shallower here, but a 45 degree angle is gonna get the fibers trapped between the thread, the thread and the hook shank. And by doing this, what, what you're trying to do, you're trying to control the twisting of the material on the shank. So when you wrap backwards, going backwards with this, make sure you position your, your fibers where you want them, okay? So now you've got the tails on, okay? So I always put the material on my side of the hook and then I use the thread torque to sort of move it over to the shank where I want them to be. I'm going to enjoy. the next ingredient, a little bit of oval tinsel. This is the silver variety. You can, you can use gold. If you have gold, you can use mylar. Mylar is a bit more challenging to work with in my opinion. So I try to avoid it for, for certain flies. And here I'm not happy. I'm trying to catch this on the underside of the hook. And sometimes you just have to leave a little bit more and try to pull this. This is a little bit more challenging because it's a little rough. So I'm going to trim that tag at the end. So I'm keeping the tinsel on my side of the hook and wrapping over it, right? This looks like a major waste of material but the purpose for doing something like this is to maintain that clean, smooth underbody and avoid having ugly bumps at the back end of the fly. And what I'm going to try to do is trim off this little tag of tinsel at the front. Okay, I got rid of it. Then spiral quickly back to the front. And the next ingredient, is going to be some plain black floss. If you have silk floss, if you have embroidery floss on a size 14 fly, all you want is just the one strand. If you want, you can maybe get away with two strands, but that is about the limit. You don't want this to be too bulky. And you might notice that I like to keep my floss as well on a bobbin. And that's for easier control. And what I've done here is I've basically done the same thing as with the oval tinsel. I just put the floss on the other side. So now my body is kind of 
equally fattened on both on both sides. Okay, so nicely wrap this to to the tying point at the back, and then spiral back to the front. Question. Heather. And then I just use my bobbin to wrap the floss forward, same way as with anything else. It's very easy to, to, to keep it, keeping it in a bobbin allows you to untwist if it twists. So when you, when you put the floss on, you want it to go flat. So you get a nice, smooth, flat body. Okay, when you come to the end, oops. and there, they got on to fly time. Just secure and cut on top of the hook. Yeah, took them an hour. Then take the tinsel and start wrapping in nice, neat. Take your time here because this is a make or break in terms of looks. You do nice, evenly spaced. So I did one, two, three, about four wraps. And secure this at the front with a thread. And trim. Notice that with tinsel and stuff like that, I always trim deep inside the jaws of my of my scissors who start to feel like they they probably could use some some sharpening okay next i'm going to use a little hackle and you can use hen you can use rooster you don't want to have high grade dry fly rooster hackles here Okay, so the, the saddle stuff that, that Dave was showing on the Renegades is not the right material for this fly. So what I've done here is I've taken a black hackle off a cheap cape. And this is very, very close to the head of the bird where you get the small hackles. And I stripped the fibers, I, I stripped the fluff as usual, and I strip also the fibers on one side, but this is gonna give me, this is going to give me a slightly more uh, sparse hackle at the head. So I'm going to be doing more turns. I'll have a little bit more control on how, how the fly is gonna look at the end. So what I'm doing is I'm going to attach this hackle on top of the hook like this. And I will start in the front and I'm going to go with my thread a few turns back to where about my first wrap of the ribbing starts kind of looking looking backwards like this okay so this is this is what it looks like right now okay and then I'm going to get some hackle pliers. And today I'm going to use some exotic looking hackle pliers. Uh, I picked this up a few years ago. I don't use it an awful lot, but you, you know, there are various, various options, which are all variants of that sort of standard English hackle plier. And it's the same reason as Dave explained earlier, which is with a rotating hackle plier, in this instance, you have a little less, less control. So here's my, my hackle. Notice that now the thread is well behind the hackle, and I'm going to wrap this hackle backwards, as it were. So from the front towards the back of the fly. Okay. So go back. There's one turn. Two turns, probably I can do one more turn. And hey, buddy. This is, this is a hey, very you. lightly hackled Molly, fly. How you doing? Molly, out of there. Molly, that's feathers. Don't worry. Robert. Okay. Robert, so, you might want to put your computer on mute. So now what, I, what I'm going to do is, I, I'm done with the hackle pliers. I could basically let the feather go which is probably the best thing to do now. So here's a stub I'm gonna deal with later. But what I'm doing now 
is I'm going to take the thread and I'm going to put the thread through the hackle I just wrapped, doing the little wiggle dance that Dave just demonstrated earlier. And by doing so, I'm not matting down any of the fibers that I've just tied in. And the reason I, I like to do this is because this reinforces the hackle, right? So I wrap the hackle backwards. Now I put a thread through the hackle. Now my hackle is reinforced. Next, I'm just going to take my fingers, fold all the hackle fibers back and hopefully manage to transfer them. There are always some unruly ones, but we don't worry about those. We'll deal, deal with those later. And then take the thread and start to build a head. Okay. Now this is a taut thread, so it does take a few wraps of thread. This is also one of the reasons why you, you would want to use a taut thread on a small fly. So you can you can have as much control over this as you like. Okay. Then I take my whip finisher and I do two whip finishes. No need for glue. You can, you can use some, some head cement here to give it that kind of cool glossy look, but that's okay. It also works without. And then trim the thread. And then if there's still a little bit of a mess left, like I can at least one, one purple sticking out there handle. And I can also see that my slid on a body a little bit. That's probably careful. Or if you absolutely want to make sure use wire. Wire usually so what I do to clean up is I use tweezers. Uh, it's not easy to find tweezers that, that work. Uh, these are the best ones I was able to uh, <clears throat> I was able to get my hands on. There's some Swiss ones that I've, I've seen on, online, but I wasn't able to, to order those. Um, but with these, usually you can, you can get in really close and you can clean up any sort of messy looking fibers. And that's it. Okay. Very nice. Looks good. So next one, what I would slidey, slidey tinsel. Or if you do a dub body, which is also an alternative for this, then you wouldn't have this problem because then the, the body would be rough and whatever you, you spiral around it is going to stay put. Okay, so that's the black panel, and you've seen the, the other variations. It's mostly a body color uh, variation, so switch to purple instead of black. And um, it's otherwise relatively easy to tie. Looks good, Flora. Yep, excellent. I mean, a dark Montreal is not dissimilar from that. Yep. It's a whole universe of wet flies that are pretty much, yeah, the same. Tail, rib, some kind of floss for the body, and then hackle. And then there, this is the wingless variety, and then there are like hundreds and thousands of winged wet flies that would basically be built on a base like this. So maybe at some point in the future, we'll, we'll attempt some winged wet flies, you know? We could do a hair wing coachman. That'll do the that, that would do it. You do the That's hair the, wing, I'll do the duck wing one, okay? I'll, I'll do the hair wing, it's a lot easier. <laughs> I don't like hair wings that much, so I. Uh, oh, I, I, I find they're they're pretty effective fly actually. They're not as pretty, but uh, I, again, that that hair wing coachman is, is is a great grayling fly. Yeah. Um, no, and, I'm just I just this uh, fly tying skill. I I picked up at a used bookstore here uh, a really strange book 
um, it's a it's a Japanese book that has some approximate English translated text along with the Japanese. So it's effectively a bilingual one. And I think anybody who speaks Japanese would have a, a black reading through that. But anyway, the, uh, the, the guy who did the book is an amazing flight hire, uh, Ken Sawada. And the pictures in that about 400 patterns of wet flies and they're close up photographs um, that show there was any flaw to, to show. But this guy is so good that these flies are absolutely amazing. So um, it's kind of, you know, giving me the itch to, to I think the uh, at least learned with white duck feathers, you know, that <laughs> should be able to do that. We, we, yeah, we could do a coachman. I, I, I that's probably a good progress is from uh, these basic flies to something like a coachman, uh, which is also a very effective fly uh, for trout for bull trout, rainbow trout. Yeah, we did, we did a 